This week, I turn the show over to you to answer your questions. But in my mindset moment, I tell you why I think you should fail. Before you get too upset, listen in and you'll understand why. Are you interested in property investing, success or money? Well, you're in the right place. This is the Michael Yardney Podcast, where each week you'll learn a number of new ideas regarding success, property investment and money in 20 minutes or less. Our show is brought to you by Metropole, who specialize in helping you grow, protect and pass on your wealth through strategic property advice. Now he's your host, Michael Yardney, who has once again been voted Australia's leading property investment advisor. That's the fourth time he's won a similar award in the last six years. Welcome to episode 12 of the Michael Yardney podcast, particularly to all the new listeners because our statistics show there's over a thousand new subscribers a week and that's very, very exciting for me. It keeps me motivated to give you lots of great information every week and I try and keep it in under 20 minutes because I know your time is precious. This week's the week every month or so that I hand the show over to you and answer your specific questions and I've got some good ones today. The first question I'm going to answer is about how to predict property prices. Wouldn't that be nice to know? I'm going to give you my thoughts on that. And another question we're going to answer is about how to invest on a budget. And I guess we've all got our budgets, but Ahmed Imam from Metropole in Sydney is going to answer that question. And in my mindset moment, I'm going to explain to you why it's important for you to fail. Don't get too upset because the end is going to be worth it. So let's get on with the show. How do you predict property prices? That's a question that was sent in by Michael Turner of Adelaide. Thanks for your question, Michael. And as always, I'll send you a copy of a book to say thank you for having a question read out on the show. And I guess... You're asking, how do we remove some of the uncertainty from our property investment decisions by being able to predict property prices and work out what sort of properties are going to outperform with averages? Well, firstly, let me explain that I can't predict property prices. All we try and do in our research at Metropole is find out those properties that will outperform the averages. And it really falls down to three factors, people, purchasing power, and places. People is really demographics. How many of us there are, how we want to live, where we want to live. Purchasing power has to do with affordability, but it's not cheap properties. What I'm talking about is people's ability to buy property because they can get finance, and that's often related to their wages growth, to interest rates, and to house prices. And places is supply and demand. So the three Ps, people, purchasing power, and places. Let's dig in a bit deeper and have a look at each one of these. Let's start with people because people create housing demand, but although house price rises are caused by an increase in buy demand, there's all sorts of property buyers in various different market segments and they're driven by different things. At the lower end of the market, the budget market, they tend to be the first home buyers and in general investors are in the same, much the same sort of market. And because investors have been more active recently, the first home buyers have been driven out of that lower end of the market. And a lot of that has to do with rental returns, but also upon the ability to get finance. That drives the lower end of the market. The middle markets are the changeover buyers, those families who are now upgrading into their next home because their families have gotten bigger or because they've got a bit more money, or those who are downgrading because of uh, the stage of the life they're at as well. And a lot of this has got to do with job security and uh, consumer confidence. And then, of course, there's the retirees as well, and that's the middle market. The upper end of the market, the prestige homes, well, that's more prosperous buyers, and they're very much driven by the business cycle. So that's the area of the market, the sub-segment of the market that does really well when businesses boom, when the stock market's booming, when dividends are returning large amounts. That's a little bit about people. Let's talk a bit about purchasing power, because... That's one of the big factors that has recently driven our property markets. Purchasing power for investors has been really high until recently, until APRA got in the way. Uh, And that was because we had relatively low interest rates. And again, until APRA got in the way, finance was pretty easy. Now it's changed, hasn't it? So the next segment of the market that's going to be driven uh, by 
the ability to get finance purchasing power are the first home buyers because of first home buyer grants that have been introduced in a lot of the states, as well as home buyers now being favoured by the banks um, and the ability to get a home loan cheaper than an investment loan. And the last P is places, the number of dwellings available to purchase. That's really got to do with supply and demand. Now, where most people get this wrong is they only look at one of those factors and they look at uh, increased population growth or, or supply and demand. There's a big fuss at the moment about supply and demand ratios. But people create housing demand. And if you think about it, a lot of the people creating the housing demand are migrants. A large part of our population growth is migrants, and the migrants are coming in at the right age group for household formation, and they're coming in because they've got jobs, and that creates the demand for properties. But purchasing power, the ability to get a loan, transforms the demand from people into buyers. It makes them into buyers. And then the last of the P's, property values, rise when there's a shortage of places. So it's really a combination of all those three things, Michael, that drive property values. And that's why the research we undertake to, in your words, predict, and we're not trying to predict the future, but we're trying to see where markets are going to outperform, has to do with forward planning, economic growth, jobs growth, wages growth, because that's going to make people move in to those locations where more jobs are being created. It's going to make people be able to purchase more because they're going to have good salaries. And we also then look at what's going to happen with supply and demand in those regions related to the availability of new properties. So while there's some areas where there's lots of people moving in and they've got purchasing power, if you're looking in those sub-segments of the new high-rise and off-the-market, off-the-plan markets, boy, there's just too many properties. Hope that helps answer your question, Michael. The three things to look for in predicting property values are the three Ps. If you're looking to get started in property or to grow your existing portfolio, turn to someone you can trust for independent advice. The team at Metropole Property Strategists have been involved in over $2 billion worth of property transactions, creating wealth for their clients, and they can do the same for you. They don't sell property, so their advice is independent and unbiased. Metropole can devise a strategy, their buyer's agents will buy your property for you, or you could use their renovations team property development or portfolio management services. Arrange a time for an obligation-free chat at metropole.com.au. Now here's Michael's mindset message. Remember, a change in your thinking will lead to a change in your life. If you are like most people who listen to this podcast, you want to be successful. It could be successful in property, in business, in your personal life. Well, today I'm going to suggest you should fail. Now, before you ask what I'm on about, let me explain. You see, everything that seems easy today was once difficult. All successful property investors, business people, and entrepreneurs have had their share of failures. In fact, they've had more than their share of failures, and in general, they've attempted things more often than others. Look at the already successful Richard Branson. Over the years, he's had to close down businesses that were losing money with no evidence of a turnaround. Arguably, he made bad business decisions. He made bad investments. And I dare say if he lives long enough and remains active, he's going to do it again. Now, while the US president, multi-billionaire Donald Trump's been involved in many successful real estate deals... He's also had many deals that have failed. He's been sued. He's been threatened to be sued by investors. His licenses are for hotels and universities, and that got himself into the trouble and came and bit him in the backside. Now, I'm not even going to mention about his current round of failures, but presuming another decade of active entrepreneurship, this won't be the last uh, sour real estate deal he's undertaken. Now, Disney, who's been so prolific in making fantastic movies, has also brought out some huge flops. Guess what I'm getting at is examine almost any shiny success, and on the flip side, you're going to find grimy failure. There you go. How do you feel about that fact? But have you heard the story of the cat that stepped on the hot burner and then not only wouldn't ever jump on that stove again, but wouldn't even go into the kitchen? Well, this is how most people feel about and react to failure, particularly embarrassing failure, humiliating and expensive failure. If they experience it once, 
they never want to go into the kitchen again. One punch in the nose and it knocks them out. The truth is, success scares most people. They're also the exceptionally successful individuals who are, in various ways, failures personally. I remember reading the story about the famous magician Houdini. I don't know if you know, one of my hobbies has always been magic, and I love reading about magicians, but the famous Houdini failed at almost nothing except to control his own ego, which very directly caused his premature and unnecessary death when he tried a uh, death-defying trick that didn't work. Look, when you read the biography of most exceptionally successful people, you'll find they're not even close to superior. In fact, most are horribly flawed, but manage to rise above their own foibles. I've got to admit my own history is a graveyard of mistakes and failures in my personal life, in my business life and in investments. I'm not consistently and certainly successful. If I were to try and describe all the missteps, the mistakes, the misadventures and misfortunes, it'd be best to do it that old-fashioned way with an encyclopedia, with thick volumes for each letter of the alphabet, and the entire set of encyclopedias with my mistakes would, I guess, take up many shelves. And I'm not done making mistakes. If your success game plan features to being right 100% of the time and never making mistakes, you're not going to be playing the game for very long. You're not going to rise above the others. You're going to fall and crash pretty hard. You see, the ironic fact is the game is won by losers. And if you aren't floundering or outright failing at something, you're probably not doing much of anything. Look, you've heard it said success breeds success. And it does. But what you often don't hear is the other equal truth, that failure is the other parent of almost all success. So the goal of success can never be to avoid failure. So my recommendation to you is, rather than trying to avoid it, manage it, minimise its harm, extract its lessons, leverage it in every possible way, rise above it, and that know that it will be forgotten and made irrelevant in time. Now, Harrison, my son, is really into basketball, and he told me that Michael Jordan claims he's missed more than 9,000 shots in his professional career. Harrison told me that 26 times Michael Jordan had the winning game shot in his hands and missed and lost. Michael Jordan's quoted as saying, I have failed over and over and over again in my life, and that's why I succeed. So my mindset lesson for you today is, if you want to be successful, you'll first have to fail. If you're enjoying our show, please subscribe on iTunes. You'll find us there as Michael Yardney Podcast, and we'd really appreciate it if you would leave us a review. When you do, we'll read it out on the show. By the way, Michael creates a lot of content he only sends out by email, which you can have with no obligation. So also visit michaelyardneypodcast.com and subscribe to his commentary there. I recently got a question from Gitu on our website, and she asked as follows. What if my borrowing capacity is only five to $600,000? Would buying an apartment in good suburbs, like you suggest, bring good results? What does a small investor like me do as a strategy? Well, first of all, Gitu, thank you for the question. And secondly, five to $600,000, in my mind, still gets you a good budget in some very good locations, and maybe not in Sydney, but in other locations, so to help answer your question and help you understand how at Metropole we put together a strategy to uh, suit our clients' budgets, risks, lifestyles, uh, I've asked Ahmed Imam, Senior Property Strategist at Metropole in Sydney, to help answer your question. So welcome, Ahmed. Hi, Michael. Pleasure to be here. Now, you've heard Gitu's question. Um, I'm not sure I what have. state she's from. She didn't leave that. So how would you respond? Uh, well, look, I know there are many people in a similar position, so thank you for the question, Gitu. And I think affordability is at the top of everyone's concerns at the moment, and I, I don't blame them, really. The best way for me to answer the question, Michael, is probably to keep it simple. Um, and when you buy an investment property, there are really only three parameters that come into play. Number one is the price, and usually your budget is set by the banks, and you really don't have much say on this at present. So this one is out of your control, Gitu. But just make sure you use an investment-savvy mortgage broker who can actually look at your situation holistically. Number two is the location. Now, this one is certainly in your control, and it is absolutely critical. 
and you can't afford to compromise this as 80% of your property performance will be due to its location. You know, it's the capital growth that occurs in the location because of the demographics, as in people in the area being able to, you know, being able and, and willing to pay a premium to live there. That's what actually pushes the value of the property up. The third thing is the property itself, meaning you can't just buy any property in that location. You must buy an investment-grade property, as, as Michael alluded to. If you can't purchase at least an entry-level investment-grade property, then you simply wait until you can. And that's, that's some of the biggest advice that I can give. One of the biggest mistakes I see investors make is that they buy investment properties based on affordability. And affordability is not an investment strategy. It is simply buying a property because you can afford to buy it. That makes a lot of sense, but five to six hundred thousand dollars. This particular example is a pretty good budget. So, if you had five to six hundred thousand yep. dollars to spend, where would you spend it? What would you do? Yeah, look, if it was me and I had five to six hundred k, I'd I'd much rather buy an apartment in a top location as opposed to a house on a on its own block of land in a secondary location. I mean, it's it's incorrect to say that the apartment doesn't really have a land component. It does. You know, it has the notional underlying land component of the whole apartment block. You know, it could be one-sixth or one-eighth of the total land. And as we mentioned, you know, high-rise apartment towers have the land-to-value ratio the other way around. You know, the developer tries to squeeze as many properties, uh, or apartments, I should say, on the land as he can. So investors need to keep in mind that, yes, land is important, but not all land is created equal. And I think you actually taught me that one, Michael. <laughs> <laughs> I'm hearing some of my lessons there. That's fine. When we put a strategy together for clients at Metropole, we really discuss what their budget is. And as I um, said, that's usually set by uh, the banks. And then we decide what the right property is in the right location. And we're working with clients at the moment. We've got one I know you've got one client uh, with a budget of seven and a half million dollars, and if people have got three, Correct. four, five million dollars, we'll often buy them a block of apartments. Uh, if they've got one to two million dollars, we'll often get them involved in a medium density development, a duplex development where there's great bang for bucks. If they've got the finance to be able to do it, and also the risk capacity to be able to do it, um, and, and if they've got a budget in the 800s, 900s to to one and a half million dollars. It's either an apartment or a townhouse, or in Melbourne, often we'll buy villa units which have got a land component. And below that, uh, really, it is basically apartments that we buy because in the investment grade areas of Melbourne and Sydney, you can only buy an apartment in that price bracket. However, in Brisbane, there are definitely locations where your budget of five to six hundred dollars would allow you to buy in uh, to a, a suburb which will grow above average and you could well buy a house there and if you're buying a property as you know we always like to buy properties with upside potential as well where you can maybe add value through renovations or development so your budget does give you quite some options but probably it will be starting to get tight in Sydney is that right Ahmed? That budget. Yeah, look, things things are getting tight in Sydney, and it just means that we really have to place a focus on now buying the right property in the right location, and also, you know, be willing to buy an apartment as opposed to a house. You know, times have changed. People have exchanged their, you know, backyards for balconies, as as you say, uh, and we're finding some great properties. We just have to be patient, and you have to have the right guidance behind you. In fact, I remember in a previous podcast, Pete Wardgen put it nicely also, and he said they're trading space for place. So they want to be in the right location. That's where people want to live. Um, and so, uh, again, we're saying much the same thing. Thank you very much for answering Gitu's question, Ahmed. And Gitu, for sending us in the question, we're going to send you a book out in the mail. And if any of our listeners want to have their question answered by me or one of our team of experts, please leave it in the comments box or michaelyardneypodcast.com. Thanks for your time, Ahmed. Thanks, Michael. Appreciate it. Thanks for spending the last 20 minutes or so with us. We really only got through two questions today because they were reasonably long answers, but I think they were particularly good questions. So thanks for leaving your questions on the website. I look forward to answering them. And in particular, thanks to those who've left reviews on iTunes. That helps spread the word. And I look forward to reading those. And I'm actually going to read a couple out loud each week because they 
may inspire you to pass the message on to somebody else. That just pays it forward and helps us rank better and get our messages out to more people. And this week, we got a review from Anastasia who said, fantastic information to get me started, Michael. Thanks for the information. Well, thank you, Anastasia. And Rihanna Navy said... I always listen to Michael's podcast on my daily walk, highly recommended, and she left a five-star review as well. Thanks a lot, Rihanna, and I look forward to presenting you another show next week when I'm going to give you some ideas about property investment, success and money, and how to make the most of your life. Look forward to catching up with you again next week. Thanks for listening to this week's episode of the Michael Yardney Podcast, which was brought to you by Metropole, who help their clients grow, protect, and pass on their wealth through strategic property advice. If you got value from listening to this podcast, please leave us a review and we'll read it out on a future show. Just go to michaelyardneypodcast.com forward slash review, and it will take you over to iTunes where you can enter a review and let us know what you think. We'd really appreciate it. If you don't already subscribe on iTunes or on your Android phone, you'll find us there as Michael Yardney Podcast. If you'd like to gain instant access to the show notes or a transcript of the show, head across to michaelyardneypodcast.com. Watch out for our show next week. you learn some new ideas about property investment, success, and money in around 20 minutes.